happen to admire the difficulty and what, what we say the answer is. Judges, just checking. Do you still need five minutes, um, or are you ready? Apparently, they asked you something well, yeah, last um, night. They, did they've they? given us some, some late arriving homework. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I'm with uh, intent to start. You intend to start on time. Yeah, we are. Okay. To start. Yeah. Okay.
another evil. Yeah. Uh, 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 no, sorry, it's um, it's the same one. It's just I, I've got it forwarded to me as well. there might be two courses. Either we could undertake each of us to provide answers in writing, um, or uh, if you were content for me to, to continue to develop my submissions, and then we might break mid-morning for five minutes or so. Or yeah. so well, maybe the, that would be the better way forward, if possible. Yes, but you, you continue with your submissions now. Let's see how we go. Well, more, if, if that's convenient. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I was making submissions yesterday about the interrelationship between Section 22 1A and B, to which uh, the court's worked examples relate, in the context of this first question of mutually exclusive provisions. Yes. Um, there were a number of points that were left over or, or held over from uh, yesterday. Melania Friend um, intervened right as we broke yesterday just to draw your attention to a case about the Noscutor principle, which is the Wellington Private Hospital case. Yes. Um, we've identified um, two other fairly recent cases, as you might expect there are plenty of them, but two fairly recent cases where the principle has been considered and applied, either in this court or in the House of Law, provided to your clerks by email, and we have paper copies, yes. if that's um, uh, appropriate. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll come back briefly to those okay. um, in, in a little while. Your Lordship also asked about um, the heading to the legislation. Yes. <laughs> um, and my vague recollection was correct that if one goes back far enough, there was a view that it wasn't appropriate to look at either the headings or the marginal notes. Um, that approach has now uh, been uh, overtaken by, by, by events and judicial attitudes. So it's recorded best in a decision of the House of Lords in a case called Mantia. Right. Um, and we have sent you by email the extract from Bellion right. as a suitable collection of the, the current principles. Well, thank you very much for that. So, as regards the headings, <coughs> if it is appropriate for you to have regards to them, um, we would quite accept that they, they can't be determinative, but they are, they are material. Thank you. Um, third point was I gave a very short summary yesterday of how capital allowances were designed to cater for the depreciation of assets. And I mentioned the writing down allowance rate at 25%. And I also mentioned um, the IBA rate, or industrial buildings allowance rate. But I'd made the point that if you have writing down allowances at 25%, you get your full tax relief by about about. That's the yes. way it works out mathematically. Um, what I failed to mention um, is that there are relevantly two rates of allowances for plant and machinery. There's what's called the main rate or the main pool rate, which is 25% on a reducing balance basis. And there is a, a special lower rate, what are called long life plant assets. And those are plant assets that have a life, an expected life of greater than 25 years. And that rate of plant and machinery allowances is much lower. Uh, in the first year we're concerned with here, it was at 6%, I think it's now 8%, but the effect of that is you get your relief, but not, not as the way it works out mathematically, it's about year 50. Year 50, yeah. And the assets that we are concerned with here, the ones that are still in dispute, are long life plant assets. So my own friend yesterday said at one point that if we were right, we would get relief in effect over, I think he said, seven years. And the answer is, no, that's not right. It's about 50 years. There was a time when you could get 100% capital allowances in the first year, which obviously made 
it's very advantageous to say something was plant or machinery. My Lord, yes, and that, that first year 100% allowance has come and gone from the legislation yeah. as the Treasury has either encouraged or disencouraged um, yes. capital investment. Yeah. years at the rate of 6%, is that right? Which is the rate? Uh, which is the rate? Uh, My Lady, yes. It's, it's not exactly 50 years, but but yes. you've had 98 or 99 percent of the relief by about year 50. So if, if we are right in this case, for what it's worth, we would get allowances that will eventually pay out our expenditure of tax relief by about year 50. If we're wrong, we get, we get nothing. So, and that's at 6 percent, and did you say it's recently gone um, up to 8 It's or? currently 8 percent. But that, would that, that wouldn't apply here, presumably? Or? Uh, it, it, it does. But from it, whatever um, date it was introduced. I forget now when the rate became right. 8%, but okay. it makes a difference, but not by much. All right. So okay. I can't remember mathematically what Don't it worry. does, but maybe you get to year 47 instead of year 51. Okay. But the difference is, is not material. Right. Thank you. So that has this tiny consequence that when we come to debate the procedural issue, my own friend suggested a couple of times yesterday it was worth worth. It's not. It's the net present value of allowances at that low, current low rate on expenditure that's about two million. Yeah. Now I haven't done the sum, but it's worth tens of thousands, not not millions. Okay. So small point. Um, more substantively, a couple of points raised by my lord, my lord, Lord Justice Popperwell, um, about Section Twenty Two One B. And if I can just finish off with those two points, yes. and it may be I'll need to come back and read when we look at your Lordship's and my Lady's examples. Yes. But my Lord's point uh, was, was, I think, this, that um, our case is the application of Section 22, subsection 1, requires the identification of expenditure, now to use a neutral term, on an item. And that item has first to be identified by what is referred to in the authorities as either the piecemeal or the entirety approach. So I'm just pausing there to take a, a simple example removed from the facts of this case. If one is looking at an oil rig, one might regard the whole rig as the item, the character of which you would then test against the legislation. Conversely, you might regard each nut and bolt, each steel element, as the element to be tested. And both of those extremes are probably not very sensible. So the middle course is to say, well, an oil rig is made up of lots of different systems and elements, and you would apply the legislation to each of those rather than to the entirety. But which you do has to be decided at the outset. And the view of the authorities, including of the decision of the House of Lords, is that that is for the fact-finding tribunal to determine whether it's appropriate to look at the entirety or piecemeal, and if so, which piecemeal. And once that decision has been made, then that is fixed, unless it can be said they made an Edwards and Bairstow type error in determining the and that's reflected here in the first tier's decision, paragraphs 30 to 32. So the items that one comes to test um, are the items that the, the tribunal found sensible as the way of looking at the deep here to apply the legislation. Yes. And hitherto, conventional view would be once you've done that exercise and identified your item on a piecemeal basis, you test <coughs> that item or the expenditure on that item against the legislation without subdividing that expenditure. Subdividing the piecemeal. You've taken an example where you have a piecemeal approach, so you don't subdivide pieces as it were. Exactly. Yeah. Once, 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 once you've identified. Once one has broken down, yes. you then test the elements you have identified.
subdivide yes. without subdividing the expenditure on any one of them. Yes. yes. They don't subdivide the expenditure, yes. not just the item. So it's, it's, it should be all or nothing, you say. That's the conventional view. Right. Well, but that's not what's happened here. Because there was a subdivision of the expenditure by the FTT saying that some only some, well this will come out when you look at the example whether if some but not all of the expenditure on the item is within item 22 whether some of it can be allowable but not all of it, well, it, it this issue becomes live um, of what is economically in, in numerical terms a very marginal part of the debate but it's about the, the cut and cover um, element of the, the, the conduit as to whether it's appropriate to divide that up into the <coughs> cost of the concrete and the cost of digging the trench and filling it back in again. But as my lady said, that is what the FTT did in this case. Yes. And although the, the upper tribunal disagreed with or, or came to a different conclusion, it didn't come to a different conclusion on the basis, as I understand it, that it was impossible to allow some expenditure of a piecemeal bit, but not other. It, it respected the division that the first tier had made, but said that there was a different legal result because of a different analytical approach. It may be better we see this in context when we get there, but the, the starting point is is entirety or piecemeal, and if piecemeal, what pieces? Now, we also know from the authorities that the provision of an item includes its construction, and that can be construction in situ. And we know that from the Barclay Curl dry dock case, which was about the cost of digging the hole and then pouring the concrete. And that was said to be on the provision of plumb. <coughs> Equally, we haven't looked at this, this case, but there is the swimming pool case that my learned friend mentioned, where the items in dispute were the cost of digging the hole and then pouring the concrete and lining it to make the pool held in the High Court, that was part of the cost of the provision of the plumb. So against that background, <coughs> one has to test the item one has identified and ask is it on the provision of, of, of plant. But as the court has recognized, the statutory formulation in 221B is different to the formulation in 221A. 1A asks whether what is otherwise expenditure on plant is that barred because it is on the provision of certain assets, being those assets listed in list B. Whereas the formulation in B is slightly different, it asks you to identify whether what is otherwise expenditure on plant but is it expenditure on works? The works there is the equivalent of, of plant or asset in, in 221A, but it has to be expenditure on works of a particular type, being works which involve the alteration of land. Now, it may be that that formulation is linguistically necessary because one cannot provide works. But our case is, notwithstanding the, the rationale for that linguistic difference, that if your expenditure is on the provision of an item which is a structure, then ask is that structure in list B, and it either is or it isn't, 
but you are then giving effect to 1a, and you don't need to look to 1b. And conversely... Well, that's only because you have construed b. I mean, b could be drafted in a way which made it obvious it did apply, or could apply, to things to which a applies. So, I mean, you can't, you can't just sort of read A on its own and say, well, we don't need to look at B. You have to construe B to, in order to conclude that um, if it is a structure, only A applies. Well, uh, our, our case is that whether one construes A then B or construes yeah, A in light of B. Well, whichever. But it still comes back to what does B mean? Yes, because we have to give effect to it, well, and we have to get, we have to understand B in order to see whether A um, is exclusive as re regards uh, structures or other assets in list B. Well, I, I accept that. Yeah. Mm. I, I'm not seeking to, no, to invite. But you I think it true. all comes down to what does B mean. That's really what I'm saying about that. That's my view anyway. But, right. And what you say, it, you say that the works. Well. Because yesterday I thought we we discussed <coughs> whether the the plant in A is obviously the, the structure or the assets. It's uh, tab three, page thirty-four. Yeah. But is the plant in B the works? Or the alteration of land? It's the works. Ah. Oh. Because it, it what is barred <coughs> expenditure what one could interpret expenditure that is otherwise this is the first line, otherwise on the provision of plant or machinery, because you've passed the common law test, does not include expenditure. A, on the provision of a structure or asset in B, list B, or expenditure on any works. It has to be, what is barred here is expenditure on works, provided those works have a particular character. Right, so you're using the word works as so, a, a noun. It's a noun. <laughs> rather <laughs> than a, a result, rather than the process yeah. of getting to the result. Yes. yes. works there is the equivalent of structure or other asset. And that is the distinction drawn, we say, with um, help from the heading, but more importantly, more forcefully, from 22.3 which is keen to draw a sharp distinction between structures, buildings, and land. <coughs> so that's why we say, if my learned friend were right, his construction of little b would be so broad as to cover most or all of the items in list B. So, so do you say B means works comprising only the alteration of land? Is that what it means essentially? No, it, it's 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 any works where the, 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 the works, <coughs> which is the product, the noun, involves the alteration of land. It's not limited to comprising. So it's therefore the land, what, what, what I might call the earthworks aspect, or what otherwise is, is involved in the provision of a structure, is it? No, 
overlord because well, the, why doesn't that involve because the, of the the earthworks that are necessary to produce a structure we know from the House of Lords in Barclay Curl are part of the provision of the structure. Well, that, that's why I thought your submission would be that what B is confined to is works in the sense of the outcome, uh, the noun, which actually comprise alteration of land, it, it, distinct it, from structure. It, it may be then, my lord, I, I misunderstood your lordship's observation. But that is the distinction we draw between B and A. And I thought my lord was putting to me a, a, a purpose type question, which is only relevant when we get to C22. Well, can I try it again and see if it's. Uh, 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 well, it's my fault. Uh, it, it, do, we, do we read B as, as meaning works which comprise uh, and only comprise the alteration of land? Uh, put that way, my lord, yes. So it's not, I mean, I can bash this further, but to make sure I'm saying. So it's therefore, it's different from if it said does not include expenditure on altering land. Correct. It, yeah. yeah. And it, it's, the, it's the production of an item that meets the noun works by the alteration of It, it's a very odd phrase, I must yes. say. I mean, actually, you're, yes, you're really saying involving means comprising, I think. It's any works comprising the alteration. It is, yes, the, the building of a, a mound. And so in circumstances where at common law that would be plant um, or machinery. Lord, ye, yes. Yes. Uh, it's yeah. sort of a... Involving is a strange, strange word to choose. I think, but anyway, but the the only point I, I I think I probably misunderstood my lord's observation. But the only point I had in mind is that when we come to C twenty two, yes, the footprint of C twenty two is not coterminous with the footprint of twenty two one b. No, but it's no. not a subset of it either, in a sense, because it's it that is dealing with carrying out. The alteration, the alteration right. itself, yes. where you have a, a sole purpose. I mean, yes. Is um. Sorry. Uh, I, I mean, is is the um. The reason for C twenty two may be that you are adopting a piecemeal approach. Would identify two separate stages, if I can put it that way, or pieces of plant. One of which is the the earthworks, and the other is the the the, the piece of equipment, let's say, that you then install. Is, is it catering for that sort of? Well, case? That, it, it would cater for that. It would cater because if you have done some noun works. Yeah. You are barred by 221b. Yeah. But some, there may be a, an element where you alter the land only to install some other item. I mean, the odd thing there is that normally, as I think you've said, that would all be one, you know, the whole approach would be involved. You wouldn't split it down into the altering the land and then installing the equipment. My lord, yes. That is, that is correct. But, but one can also think, test it this way, that, that if there were to be <coughs> the sort of divide that is theoretically, I don't say it is right, but theoretically might be possible, if somebody constructs a structure and spent, say, 30 on the structure and 70 on altering the land, yeah. on one reading, which we say is wrong, but on one reading, the 30 would be allowable, mm. but the 70 would no, not. That's no, but, I've, yeah. but, it, but so, so the person who does that gets allowances on 30. Yes. He then sells that asset to somebody else for 100. And the person who buys it is just acquiring it. Mm. So he then gets allowances on 100. Yes. And so you, 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 
that that line of thinking has inadvertently drawn a distinction between constructing an asset and acquiring an asset. I think that that may that's a useful response. I think to one of the examples. I think uh, in, in, in a, to, to finish that thought off, in a world where there is no indication at all in the legislation that people who construct assets should get a different treatment to people who acquire assets. That, that supports your <clears throat> what you've described as the conventional view, that once you've decided which bits are piecemeal, then it's all or nothing, because <clears throat> you mustn't distinguish between someone who constructs and someone who acquires. <coughs> My Lord, yes. It's very <coughs> difficult to maintain that, though, because of this, of item 22, If the footprint of, of, of 22 is where you've incurred um, a, a, a separate head of expenditure, it, it, it provides you a limited degree of relief, i.e. you're saved from the import of 22.1, but only where you can say that this expenditure altered the land only purpose of installing the plant. But I don't see how you can apply that and still not be dividing up the expenditure on the plant. Well, yeah, I think, to take my, my Lord's observation, it, it rather depends on what piecemeal you have started with. You, you, might, you might have different piecemeals, one of which is the plant itself, and the other is separately the channel you dug in order to Install it. Uh, let's imagine that you want to put a, a structure in a part of the Scottish Highlands that is really rather difficult to arrive at. And in order to get it there, you have to build a road. You build a 10 mile road in order to put some structure. It's, it's possible to see all of that as one. Um, piecemeal, or by that would be the entirety, but in a world where you don't, then that would explain, that would give force to C22, hmm. because you've only altered the land in order to install the piece of the plant. And you might then have to remove the road for environmental reasons, so there might, there might be nothing there at the end of it. It's plant, but that is. It, it's well, not I on. Suppose, well, I suppose it's not plant. But, but well, mm. the court will know it's not unusual for people to have to build things to build other bigger things, and then they go and take out the first thing they put in because they're required to put the land back to, to as it was. Yeah. Now, as with all these cases, my friend identified, yeah. there are fine and subtle distinctions. But my only point at this stage is one shouldn't get drawn into a world where you're necessarily dividing construction from acquisition. Yes, no, I follow that. But then to pick up my Lord, Lord Justice <coughs> Popplewell's point yesterday about renovation, when these two points fit together, um, we had said and do say that my learned friend's reading of 221B is too broad, and it would have the effect of overriding um, uh, list B. Um, my Lord put to me yesterday, well, what about the renovation of an asset, such as, a, let's say, a crane or a lifting device in a container park? Now, in order to test that, let's assume the expenditure is capital, so we take that debate off the table, and let's assume the item is common law plant, so that debate is off the table, and let's also assume that it's a structure. Now, for these purposes, to be within the structure's element of legislation, you have to be a fixed structure. And that's 22.3a. You've got to be fixed to the land. So at the time of the initial creation of this crane or lifting device, I think the analysis, or in our submission of the analysis, is it was common law plant. It was a fixed structure. It's not in B1 to 6, but it is in B7. <coughs> Let's assume it's saved by B7a, because you're carrying on the right sort of trade. And at 
that stage, we would say you apply 221A and you don't apply 221B. Now, whether that's right or wrong, let's park that, and then let's assume some further work is done in a later year where the expenditure is on the top part of the crane, so you're not doing anything with the base. You, let's say you put a new top structure on that will carry heavier weights. So that expenditure would be on an item of common law plant. It would still be on a fixed structure that's not in B1 to 6 but is in B7. But that would not engage 221B because that expenditure would not do anything to the land. And my Lord's point, I think, yesterday to me was, well, isn't that an example of a case where expenditure would fall within list B, but not fall within section 221B? Well, actually, my point was rather simpler. I don't know if this is going to undermine our explanation, but I was assuming something that was within uh, B1 to 6. So um, uh, it's, not, it's not excluded because it's within 7, but it's excluded because it's part of a wharf or a dock or let's say it's the top part of a dam so that it's it's something which is renovated or replaced as part of a structure which is one of those items one to, one to six but doesn't itself involve having to do anything more to the land that's what I had in mind well, let me take that let's imagine there's a seawall that's two meters high and then because of fear of flooding you want to make it a seawall four meters high So in those circumstances, let's assume it's still capital expenditure on common law plant, it's within B, this B. But in those circumstances, you haven't done anything to the land itself, so you don't engage 221B. But equally, one would not expect there to be a difference in outcome according to whether it's the initial expenditure or additional expenditure. Right, so it would all be excluded because it's uh, not allowable. The, the addition of the extra two metres to the seawall would be just excluded from the general rule by item six of list B. My lady, yes. And not saved by... Not saved by anything else. And that may be an answer to, to my Lordship's actual example. But if I just tease out where I thought we were, we were going, that if, if it were conceivable that one would produce a different answer according to whether it was the initial expenditure or later expenditure, um, there is no indication in the legislation at all that that is a purpose of Parliament here. Parliament is crudely trying to distinguish between good assets and bad assets. It's not distinguishing between initial expenditure and later expenditure. I, I entirely understand that. that my, my, my inquiry was, was um, instigated because one of your arguments was that uh, A and B would be OTOs because all structures which come within A involve the alteration of land. And I just, I, 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 that, that, that isn't right, is it? Well, um, it, it? It is right at the stage of creation of them. <laughs> and so what your logic puts me, if, if you spend more on the asset, but don't touch the land. But, but not at the point of the expenditure, which may be being considered. For an allowance. So let, let, let me accept that. We have two answers. One is that, the, that your lordship is then identifying for Parliament as the, uh, uh, an intention to draw a distinction between initial expenditure and later expenditure. We say it's not there. Um, but secondly, it doesn't take away, we would say, the force of our point that if Melania Friend is right, um, as regards the initial expenditure on any of the items in this B, you 
didn't need uh, Section 221A. So really, you're saying that <clears throat> there may be cases where um, uh, the provision of a structure or other asset in List B uh, does not involve the alteration of land, but the vast majority do. Well, what, what Parliament at least had in mind, I would say must have had in mind, was the expenditure you incur on creating all these assets. It yes. wasn't catering for a world where you put another metre on the top of a seat. Um, that's a, a long way um, of coming to the point where we say that, that once one understands the legislation, and well, I'm friends both in writing and already yesterday, don't take him anywhere. Um, and we say with, with respect that the first tier got this right, but ultimately it's an appeal from the upper tier. So we say the upper tribunal in their paragraph 78 through to 87 got this right for the right reasons. So can I just look, this is 78 to... So, so, on your reading of it, the upper tribunal arrived at the same conclusion about the interrelationship of these provisions as the first tier tribunal. But lady, they did. They're, they're expressed slightly differently, but if one wants to compare paragraphs 39 and 40 in the first tier, those are their conclusions, and then the upper tribunal's rejection of Malone and Friend's case runs from paragraph The FTT slightly muddied the waters by always going on then to consider, well, if we're wrong about this, um, how does it, it, well, it, it may come within 221B, but it's either a pipeline or it's alteration of land? My lady, in a couple of instances, not every time, the first tier this gently, but it, it forgot the logic of its own analysis and actually addressed 221B. And the upper tribunal picked that up and said they didn't need to do that. But the issue of C, list C, still arose because if I'm right about mutually exclusive, I can still need list C if you decide that there's a tunnel or an aqueduct. The, di the difficulty with your analysis is that it does it then throw a spotlight on whether these things are structures or not, and that's not really an area that's been explored in the decisions because it was thought that that question only arose for purposes of item seven, and it was agreed well if it is a structure then it's an industrial building. Well, we, we would say no to that. You, your, your lady is, is right that the, the logically the first question should be, are we, are we looking at structures? <coughs> um, it was not contended in the first tier that these were not structures. And my learned friend's case, we put it at its highest in the upper tribunal was, well, the, upper, the first tier haven't quite found that they are. But it is crystal clear on a fair reading of the first tier's decision that it proceeded on the basis that they were structures. And one can see that from their paragraph 43. And we had this debate in the upper tribunal, and the upper tribunal put the matter beyond doubt um, in their paragraph 145. Had exactly this debate in <coughs> Judge Harrington. So they say it was implicit, and it is implicit throughout the judgment of the first tier. Um, it can be seen in paragraph 43 of the first tier that the upper tribunal. 
program so even if it's necessary or alternatively if it is necessary they made a finding of fact of that today and the front has not challenged that so your leadership is, is absolutely right it, it is logically the first question but that question has been answered and they are struck That, it's taken me much longer than I, I thought it, it would, I apologise, but that, that's what I say on my question one. Right. Would it help the court now to explore my lady's examples? Or well, I think maybe it would be better for you to continue your... I'm mean, happy for you to do so on your feet, um, if you're happy to do that, or you complete your submissions and then perhaps we give you two minutes. Perhaps if we do the latter, then I'll, I'll just briefly discuss the, these things with Mr Ripley. So um, that's my first main submission. Um, yes, we are uh, structures, and that deals with my question three as well. Yes, we are structures. Um, we are to be tested against 221A and not 221B. So then the question is, are we a tunnel or an aqueduct? Um, now, trite law, it's an exercise in statutory construction. We have to discern Parliament's intention from the words used. We have to read those words purposively and in context, and where appropriate, that does allow account to be taken of the nostrator principle. A well, learned friend has found a case in which it is said to be a relatively weak principle. We've given you a couple of instances, the Shamoon case in the House of Lords, and there's a case called Tectoral in this court, where the court applied the principle without describing it as either as a strong principle or a weak principle. In our, our submission, the strength of the, the principle from the circumstances in which you consider its use. Yes. There will be some circumstances where one can on principle because the context is so yes. overpowering. Mm. And there will be circumstances where you can use principle because the context is not overpowering. So th there is no um, hierarchy of principles that would automatically regard that as being a weak one. It rather depends on the words you are asked to consider. I've made these points uh, yesterday, but when Parliament came to legislate in List B, it chose to list <coughs> six separate categories of item. It made some kind of conscious choice with item seven as the sweep up of any other structure. And we place significance in both the terms that were used and the place in which they are used, but they do take colour from the words that surround them. <coughs> uh, we accept that dictionary definitions are helpful but not determinative, but we do say that industry usage, even usage by my clients, not determinative. My friend tempted before the first tier to get some quasi-expert evidence in as to what a civil engineer would understand by a tunnel. Right. The first tier rejected that. Well, then a friend tried again at the hearing, right, what was described in the decision as the back door, and that was rejected as well. So what you're concerned with is what did Parliament think was meant by these terms, or what did Parliament intend these terms to mean, mm. and not with what an engineer either would or wouldn't understand. Yeah. So, so the example of the Thames, whatever it is, tunnel, is, is really beside the point, isn't it? It is. It's a, it's a large sewer. It's a cloaca maxima. Yes. <laughs> um, and the fact that this was some one or more elements here were made by a tunnel boring machine, well, that, that can't be the answer. No. Um, equally, we say it is important to bear in mind that you're not just looking at labels. They're not words as labels. The common law of plant here requires one to identify the function of an asset. Does it function as plant, or does it function as setting, or premises? And the draftsman must be taken to have known that, because he is altering the outcome for plant. So you are concerned with the terms that Parliament has used against the background of the the need to identify the characteristics of the asset, but also their function. So 
one can't ignore either function or characteristics. Yes, and the, the function also depends on the nature of the business that's been <coughs> carried out. I think. I mean, it's the the golf course, or if you were making a track for mountain bike riding, things like that, you would want to make all sorts of dips and mounds and things. And if you're in the business of running a mountain bike racing premises business, then you might say, well, those are my plants. Um, and whereas they wouldn't ordinarily be regarded as plants. My lady, yes, and there's an example of that about pipes. There's a case called Bridge House, where this court says that a pipe um, is unlikely to be plant of a, of a of a restaurant business, but is likely to be plant of a water business or a sewage business. Yes. It rather yeah. depends on the nature of the business that you're carrying on. So against that background, um, we say a tunnel, read in context here, is a subterranean passageway through an obstacle to allow the passage of a path, a road, a railway, or a canal being designed to allow the passage of people, animals, or vehicles. And that is um, in accordance with the dictionary. Just for your note, it's in the second volume at tab 40. Um, there's a lot of pages there, but the page you want is 677. Of the authorities? Of the second authorities bundle, tab 40. Now, we have also included in the bundle, there are other um, statutory provisions or acts that have a, a definition of tunnel that would accord with that. Can I say because it means tunnel there that it means tunnel yeah, here? Yeah, the answer yeah. is no. Quite. I mean, why have a definition there and not here? Yeah. <laughs> um, but we say that that reading of tunnel um, satisfies the context of list B1. So you're saying that the FTT was right, that it's the ordinary meaning of word rather than the upper tribunal being right saying it's not the ordinary meaning, meaning but read in context here that's what it's limited to. Yes I, I, I'm in the, the luxury position of, of saying they were both right yeah. that it is but, the ordinary meaning yeah. Yeah. but it at least so primary it, submission is the FTT was right but if they were wrong then the UT was right. Well yes, yes. Right. and we get that and the court has this uh, the context there, tunnel, bridge, viaduct, aqueduct, embankment or cutting. Yes, well you'll come on to those items, no doubt. Tunnel, bridge, viaduct, all structures or items by which roads or railways typically would pass through or over or under obstacles. Same for embankment or cutting. I'll come to aqueduct in a little while, but notice its position um, after viaduct. <coughs> so that's what we say is the meaning of tunnel. Um, and does it matter here that list C25 talks about a tunnel with a primary purpose? And the answer we say is no, because that is giving special treatment to that which is otherwise a tunnel, properly understood, but you still get allowances as long as the primary is to carry a cable. Uh, and as the first here identified, it's their paragraph 128, we had an example of that here, which was the transformer cable tunnel. So paragraph what was that? 128. Yes. 
that was the tunnel that carried the cable from the transformer yes. um, out towards the grid. Yes. And we could and did walk down it, people do. I see. The main and is that the reason that they gave for that friend? Uh, my lord, yes. It's 128. 128. Yes, right. Uh, oh. Yes, right. It's 128 and 128. Yeah. Now, we lost on the main access tunnel, which is the tunnel one drives in to get to the underground caverns, even though the output cable goes back up the main access tunnel. Yes. And the it's not the primary purpose. Yeah, I follow. That's why we lost it. So it was a tunnel on our understanding of the meaning of the term, but it had a primary purpose that was different. Yes. Didn't have a primary well, purpose. Yes, I mean, tunnels are conveniently there and they're used to, as a way lead to all sorts of wiring and things rather than um, which are put in later and easily for granted. Well, the, um, the transformer cable tunnel was a like yes. a passageway and then in the tube where you move from one platform to another, it was that big. Yes. And there was a racking on the wall steel post mounted with a flat plate and then the output cable just sat on that rack. Mm. It was about head height and this tunnel was about 15-20 <clears throat> yards long, probably of that sort. And then it joined the main access tunnel and the cable went straight up the kilometre of the main access tunnel yeah. we couldn't claim that because we couldn't meet St George's Park. Right. Yeah. So the fact that C25 is expressed in the terms that it is um, is consistent with our understanding of the meaning of the word tunnel in, in this context. Yes. And, and the court has the point that the first tier uh, said the tunnel had our meaning because that was the ordinary meaning. The upper tribunal said, well, the ordinary meaning could be wider, but in context it has this meaning. And because the first tier had arrived at what <coughs> the upper tribunal thought was the right legal meaning, then the application of that term was a matter of fact for the first tier. That's the conventional view that Clark and Perks, you've identified the meaning, and once that meaning is right, then it's a matter of fact. So my learned friend here can't challenge those factual conclusions as to what are or are not tunnels. He has to say the tunnel has a different legal meaning. And we say in context with respect to that That's what we say about tunnel, aqueduct. The dictionary recognised that there were two, at least two, the two principal meanings of aqueduct. And just for your note, the dictionary is in the second volume of authorities, tab 40, but here you want page 589. But we say, read in context, Page, what was that again? Uh, 589. 589, thank you very much. And, and the court has in mind that the two, yes. two meanings are merely a conduit that carries water. Yes. Or a bridge like structure that carries typically a canal yes. over a, an obstacle. And you accept if it's the first, then, then that's. Then there are aqueducts. Then the tribunal later. found, as a matter of fact, that there are aqueducts. Yes. Here. Yes, yes. So it, it said that the head race wasn't. So that's important. But our primary case is that it got the wrong meaning of aqueduct. And the reason we say it has to have our particular meaning here is because of its context. It is found in V1. Oh, yes, so, OK. Why, why, but, but, but why does the? I'm still. I'm not quite with you. Why the con? What, what you say the context is, which, which um, leads to that result. Oh, we get there in. in oh, we'll get there. Right. Well, I do pre Yes, I, I, I know where you want to get to, and I know you want to get to it via the context. But. So 
Uh, so how do I get there? Yes. Um, in, in three steps. <coughs> Step one is to recognize that Parliament has produced six separate lists. I, I'm focusing on item one at the moment. I, I, you have made that point, yes. Step two is to say that Parliament had some common theme in mind in how it allocated terms or assets as between each of the six lists. Step three is to say that theme found in B1 are items or assets that provide for roads or railways or canals. When you say canal, what do you mean? Do you mean canals for the carriage of people or goods yes. and animals? Yes. Not for the carriage of water? No. But in the, different, uh, the OED definition, when it says the similar structure by which a canal is carried, um, are you saying that that's what they mean by the word canal there? Uh, yes, a, a can, uh, a, a, an 18th century. But that would be extraordinary, wouldn't it? I, I mean, everyone would call the Pont du Gard an act. I mean, a canal doesn't. I mean, a canal surely is a channel of water. I, I would have thought, in the context there, I mean, I would have find it extraordinary if um, uh, if canal was restricted to um, a, a channel of water for the carriage of people, animals, or goods. Because you're 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 immediately cutting out an everyday use of the word aqueduct. My Lord, we are accepting, if one looks at page 589, your Lordship has, has that over. Yes. That one meaning of aqueduct. I see. Yes, because that doesn't say anything about where. Well, what, so you're saying, I see. So you're saying that the, the Pont du Gard comes into 1A. Yes, and, and a Roman would have said that's an aqueduct. But wouldn't we? You look at the Pont du Gard, don't you say? That's a magnificent I will, aqueduct. I will say that's an aqueduct yeah. in one Yes. It, right. No, I follow that. It's carrying water to get water for drinking to the population of the town from the river. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And is that a possible, acceptable meaning of aqueduct? Yes. Yes. So, but you say in the context, it, it must mean. Uh, Two, where we use canal to mean what we would generally call yes, a, canal. a 17th or an 18th now, century. And you get waterway. that because of the ordinary meaning of tunnel, which car which is for the carriage of people, goods, and animals. Yes. A bridge and viaduct, likewise. Yes. And so you say, well, that really directs you to little two, but you've also got to look at embankment or cutting. Yes. Through. And I say those are road or railway related. So, if you had or canal a canal related, or they could be canal, yes. Yes. Okay. So, if you had a, a broad river, and you wanted to um, reclaim, if you like, land or claim land which forms part of the river, uh, in order to um, build a development, um, you obviously. You, you build an embankment. Um, it, that would not be an embankment, you would say, within item one. Lord, yes, because item one are structures dealing with different types of way that are then found in items two and three. But you can't get that out of the word embankment. Can you? Well, again, I, I have to read embankment in its context. So here we've got two words, aqueduct and embankment, both of which you have to give narrower meanings to than is would be their ordinary general meaning. You might want to have a word with Mr. Mark there is Mr. Ripley this morning. <laughs> Expostulate. Um, uh, 
Uh, Mr. Ripley rem reminds me that we have got a definition of, there's a dictionary definition of embankment. Is that right? Um, it's tab 40. <coughs> Page six two nine. Yes, especially. Yes. Right. So, um, your lordship would perhaps point me to definition number two. Yes. And I say in context here we are concerned with definition number three. That's because of tunnel, bridge and viaduct. Yes. And, and probably cutting. I mean, I, I'm trying to think. I mean, we would all normally use the word cutting to describe something which creates space for a road or railway. Um, I think I'm not sure whether there's any other obvious use of the word cutting in ordinary parlance. Not sure. Do you have a definition of cutting? We do. Um, <coughs> uh, it begins at page 619, but the relevant one is at 621. six are all what you might call water related structures aren't they I think they are four is constraining water five is dealing with the interface between the land and the water typically for commerce and then six is either constraining or managing yeah, it's a bit of a miscellany six isn't it I mean, weirs, drainage ditches and dikes don't have it, apart, apart from the water association. Well, they, they, they might all be seen as, as flood defences, flood defence type assets. Yeah. 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 So there are themes, Parliament has chosen separate themes in separate lists, and Parliament has determined that aqueduct should sit in a line with tunnel, bridge, viaduct, and aqueduct. Yeah. <clears throat> so, whilst
whilst the first sphere gave what we think is the wrong meaning to aqueduct and then made findings of fact about the particular assets, <coughs> it is to be noted, and I reiterate, it was found that the head race was not an aqueduct, even on the learned friend's view of the world. The upper tribunal said, well, they've got the wrong meaning of the word and read in context it has our meaning. So that's the upper tribunal, paragraphs 94 and 97 through to 101. And that then led the upper tribunal to um, identify errors of law and then to remake the decision. And that's roughly paragraphs 141 <coughs> through to 156. The significance of the fact that the first tier didn't regard the head race as an aqueduct is that if I'm right about not needing to look at 221B <coughs> and I'm right about the meaning of tunnel, then I succeed on the basis of the first tier's view, whatever the meaning of aqueduct. Sorry. If you're right that you don't need to look at section 221B because it's a structure. Yes. And I'm right about there being no tunnel here. Yes. Then whether I'm right or wrong about aqueduct doesn't matter for the head race. Because they found it wasn't an aqueduct, as a matter of fact. Yes. Yes. Even on the extended meaning. Even the on word, their aqueduct. meaning, which I now say is, is, is wrong and should be narrower. Now, the first tier did find as a fact that the water conduit assets that are still in dispute and the tail race, it found that they were aqueducts. And so Roots on the other foot, I'm stuck yeah. with those unless I can persuade this court they got the legal meaning of aqueduct. Yes. Now, you saw some of the photographs yesterday, um, but just so you have them in mind, there was some right at the top of the moorland, there are some uncovered channels that are lined in rock and concrete. Um, there is then the cut and cover section <coughs> that we saw cut, concrete base, steel archway in effect, yes. and then that's shuttered with concrete to form that flat-sided flat hexagonal shape, Right. and then it's all covered back over again. Yeah. So what you're left at the end of it is, or well, this is neutral as I can, a, a concrete cylinder or tube that carries the water down mm. its next stage of journey, and then there was a drill and blasted section that was then drilled and blasted, then lined with shotcrete. Um, I think in some places there were rock bolts put in first, but then it's lined with shotcrete. Uh, and just, you haven't seen these, uh, if it would just help to visualize the, uh, the respondents' unagreed bundle. Uh, you've seen I think all of the photographs in Malone and Friends unagreed bundle. Yes, I think so. Yes, he took us through all that he wanted um, us to see. Okay. Well, the respondents unagreed bundle, uh, tab three. Um, a couple of photographs on tab three. One is showing the collapse. Uh, the right-hand one is showing the bypass uh, tunnel that was put in place and that's got shotcrete lining on it but if one goes to tab four one can see the process that um, in I don't think in all of it but in large sections um, the shotcrete was sprayed onto a steel mesh that had oh, been put on the inside so in that photograph you see the steel mesh mm. Mm. And then in 
And then you see that steel mesh at tab six. And then at tab seven, you see the result. You spray the concrete on, and it then sets on the mesh to form that, that inner surface. So the steel mesh presumably helps the concrete to adhere to the rock. Yes. And in, after the collapse, a lot of this section had to be rock bolted first. And so these are metre and a half, two metre long bolts that are drilled up in and then tightened so they hold the fractures mm -hmm. in the rock. Then you steel mesh and then you spray the concrete. So as regards the head race, I say I get home whatever meaning of aqueduct. As regards the other elements, I need to persuade this court that the legal meaning of aqueduct in context is the bridge-like structure that carries typically a canal over an obstacle. And I say that that is that is the right the right meaning here. So pausing there, if I'm right so far, I don't need to look at this to see. But if I'm wrong at one of the earlier junctions, then I do need to look at this to see. Yes. Yes, your question three we've dealt with, which is, are the assets here structures? And you've shown us that. Yes. So we're on to question four. We are. Yes, thank you. My question four is, what's the scope of C22? And my learned friend submitted yesterday, right, that the Finance Act 1994 was designed to draw a line in the sand, <coughs> but also designed to codify the existing law to reflect the decisions of the courts and the tribunals and the policy of the commissioners as to what um, was or was not to be uh, accorded allowances. And again, we say that when one comes to list C, function is relevant. It's not just a label. One has to have regard to both characteristics and function. And the purpose of C22 is to permit allowances still to be enjoyed where your expenditure is otherwise on the alteration of land but only where you have the sole purpose of installing what is part of the machine. That's tab 3, page 37. Now, we had some debate in the first tier about the word only. Just to clarify, we don't contend it means anything other than sole. If you have more than one purpose, and the other purpose is not the alteration of land, then one fails the test has to be for the sole purpose, and it has to be for the sole purpose of, now to use a neutral term, putting in place plant or machinery. <coughs> but there's no debate at this stage about whether it is otherwise plant or machinery. You have to take an item that is plant or machinery and then ask, are you incurring expenditure and altering the land only for quotes installing it. And we said below in the first tier that install here includes circumstances in which you alter the land so as to create the item in situ, that item being plumb. And the first tier accepted that and the upper tribunal said that was The debate here is what does what does installing mean <coughs> in this context? And there are authorities in the bundle that make clear, perhaps what is obvious, that, that installing is a chameleon-like word that takes its colour from its context. But if I can quickly show you in the first 
volume of authorities. Uh, two, they are quite old decisions now, but first at tab 17, case of press coal, decision of this court, Lord Denning, Lord Diffock, and Lord Justice Wynne. Sorry, just before we go there, can I just <clears throat> clarify my own mind? Is your submission that this is then a, a departure from the all or nothing approach on a piecemeal basis? So if you have an item which is excluded by section 22, which is the hypothesis on which we're, we get here, it's a tunnel or an aqueduct, that then part of the expenditure is saved by item 22 of list C, it, it, it may be part, or it may be all. Well, it won't be all, because there'll be some cost of the structure itself. Won't there? If it is a structure. Well, that, your Lordship is, is right. It, it, it presupposes what has one decided is the piecemeal to be tested. Well, but... That, that seems to be putting a cart before the horse, frankly. I don't, I don't see that... I don't see... There doesn't seem to be any indication that the exercise of deciding whether you look at the oil rig or whether you look at the crane and the platform and the legs and the, and the of the oil rig is to be influenced by the need to chop it up so as to make sure that at least some of it is all covered by item 22. I, I, don't, I don't see that that's the exercise that the FTT thought it was doing or ought to have done. Um, I, don't sh I don't quite understand why you're so resistant to this idea that item 22 can give you an, an allowance of part of the expenditure, but not all of the expenditure. Resistance is, 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 is principled and not tactical. I'm, I'm just concerned with the logically prior debate. The capital lands cases since the time dot have, have, have started with the question, what are we looking at? How do we analyze it? And in order to answer that question, you have to ask, do I look at the whole rig or just some part of it? But conventionally, one starts with that question and then doesn't do so. Now, if what is being put to me is that C22, um, notwithstanding that exercise, whatever exercise you've done at the outset, C22 uh, is designed to allow you to enjoy some allowances, um, then in that world I accept that, because you're ignoring whatever exercise you did at the outset about deciding entirety or piece of it. I mean, I, where I come in on this is what I had understood you to say was that, going back to section, that this is really an exception to, um, it has to be, doesn't it, section um, 20, 22, 1B. It was originally. I mean, does it well, operate as an exception to anything else? It, when the law was changed in 2001, yeah. All of the exceptions in this C were made exceptions to both sections yes. 21 and section Well, 22. leave aside section 21 for the record. We're not, fo uh, not focusing on 21, are we? But um, in terms of section 22, I think your position is it, it is just an exception to um, 221 b mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. What is it? Uh, I'm not I sure, because I had understood, oh, I see. Oh. I understood it as being the opposite. I understood yes. that it couldn't be an exception to 21B. I, yes, I understood, I understood the distinction being that 221B uh, was something which uh, was works comprising alteration of land, where the alteration itself constituted the plant. Where the works constituted. Yes, yes, the, yes. Outcome. the, works, the outcome. The outcome. The outcome yeah. constituted the, the plant. The plant. Whereas uh, what uh, list C, uh, item 22, is concerned with is 
alterations to land, which aren't themselves plant, but are for the sole purpose of installing plant. Therefore, for example, the example you gave of a the, road, the you, road you build in to somewhere, which you might, might or might not then have to remove. So if, certainly if it's removed, that's, a, that's the alteration to land, which doesn't, leave, see, yes. doesn't, well, leave, doesn't leave you with any plant at all by yes. reason of the, the I alteration. See. Well, the road, of course, would be so, plant, but it's, it's uh, excluded because of uh, the relevant item in this B. But it might be, it might 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 be um, removed. I mean, when they no no, I understand. So yeah, that if no. it's removed, if it's re it, it's the fact of removal that proves that it was only there for the purpose of installing the plant and machinery. I mean, it's a very good example yeah. of why I was wrong to say that it's only an exception to 22, 21, sorry, twenty two one B. I see that. Yes. But I I, but I, I would have thought that you it, that if if twenty two item twenty two applies to 221B, then 221B has no content because on if you if you yes. if you mm. construe installing as including mm. creating in situ, then Everything that you've done in altering the land to install the plant is done. If, if the plant is the work resulting from the alteration yes. of land, then then they would overlap entirely. Well, not necessarily entirely, because you still have to satisfy the sole purpose element. You can't have any other purpose for the expenditure. Well. I mean, I see the I see the point about it being an exception to list B. You know, from the point of yeah. a road, it could be a bridge or a tunnel as well, actually. Or it could be. Oh um, well, it can't. Then you know, we were talking about digging foundations for the mast, but you say that's the provision of it. Anyway. Yes, but, but my, my Lord's yes. observation is, is right. It, it's even in its original guise. Um, it was an exception to either 221A or 221B. Yes, right. But it, it, there is also this sort of intellectual difficulty that it, it rather depends why I'm wrong when we come to list C. Am I wrong because of 221B or am I wrong, am I right about 221B but wrong about tunnel and aqueduct? <coughs> because I need list C in either circumstance. Well, and the court's view about the scope of 221B is going to inform the debate about the scope of C22. But I think that on your interpretation of, or on, on Mr. Brennan's interpretation of 221B, he would accept that it does include works which are the result of the alteration of land, but he says it's not limited. Does say that. Oh. Anyway, we jumped on you. Yes, yeah, sorry. So I mean, it really is the the word. It comes back to the word install. Yeah. Installing. Does it mean? Can it include creating, or does it mean putting in place that which some, already exists? That which already exists. Even that you may have, you may actually have constructed it or assembled it next to, on the land, but you then put it in place. Yeah. And, and that's the point, really. Yeah, and to, to take a, a simplistic example, we have something that's got three three elements, A, B, and C. I could join A and B and C off-site, or indeed next to, yeah. and put them in crudely a hole. Yes. That would be installing. Yes. Now, does it make any difference if I join A and B off-site and then join C in the hole? say no, maybe, maybe not. What we're testing here is where I join A and B and C together, in effect, in the hole. It's not quite a perfect analogy. It's quite difficult to do it in, in those sort of very, very abstract terms, I mean, isn't it? it? If, if, you look at the, if you compare the items in list B, it's, it's quite difficult to see 
any of them be many of them being installed in the narrow sense of being created somewhere else and put it, I mean, you know, a, a sea wall, you don't build the wall and then come and stick the wall next to the sea, and you don't install a harbour, you wouldn't build a pier somewhere else and bring it to Brighton and stick it in the sea. Where, so it, it doesn't seem to apply to much in list B, but if you look at list A on page 32, waste disposal systems, lifts, hoists, escalators, <coughs> moving walkways, fire safety, main services, those do seem to me to be things that one would ordinarily describe as installing them. You install a waste disposal system, even if you do join up all the bits of it, in sight, as you must do. Yeah, I, I accept that. Mm. But that because it is largely prefabricated, isn't it? Yeah. That's the point. Um, you install the central heating system, you install the waste disposal system. You could have some yeah. you, arguments at the boundaries. But I, you, it's a perfectly natural use of the term to describe bringing components of a exactly. central heating system onto a site. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I accept exactly. it. But I think that helps you in the sense that if one looks at, well, what, what's item 22 doing? If you look just at list B, it doesn't seem to be doing anything terribly much, perhaps. <coughs> Whereas if you look at the items in list A, it does seem to be more relevant to those. And, and to, to well, but sorry, you're, sorry. But uh, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 one of the difficulties is list B, mm. it isn't a piecemeal list. So that list, list B yeah. lists the items as the whole installation, as it were. Uh, whereas actually, when you're looking at whether something's excluded under list B before you get to item 22, you may have had to look at the construction or installation of the constituent part of it rather than rather than the whole. Yeah. So it, it, it may be that it does have some relevance to list B. Yes, it does have some, but. I, should we, should we just have a look at <laughs> what we're actually talking about in this case? Let's, let's, I think that might assist yes. us, actually. So what are we talking about? This is something, if we're um, against you on the meaning of aqueduct, is this how this principally arises? Uh, yes, if I'm... If I'm or maybe uh, tunnel, too, I suppose. Well, it, it would arise. But if we, perhaps the best way to say it, if I'm right about tunnel, but wrong about aqueduct. All right, that's fine. Um, so that doesn't put the head race in play, but it puts the other things in play. So let's take one of those and see what we're talking about. Let's, if we take the one you've seen the, the most Just now, of, yes, yes, exactly. Cut and cover. Yes. Um, that's all, I mean, if I may jump in to say that's obvious, it seems to me obviously constructed there. It's not, it's not something which is assembled and then inserted or placed. It, it is, it is created. The plant is created as part of the the alteration of the land. Yes, we we cut the land. Yes, they then poured it with this poured a concrete base. Yes, brought the steel yes. frame on. Exactly, brought the concrete on. The concrete set. Yes, it all looked beautiful. Somebody checked it, and then they covered it up. It's all, and it's one exercise, and at all stages, you're altering the land, aren't you? Yes. Yes. So if 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 we get to that point, and it does depend why we get to that point, but if we get to that point, we say the expenditure we incurred there was on altering the land, because we cut it, we poured concrete on it, and then we covered it over, and what is left is different because we have created a cylindrical concrete yes. something. Yes. And the only reason we did that was to install, I say, quotes install, yes. an item that is accepted to be common law plant. Yes. Sorry, yes. When, when you buy off site, when you buy the steelwork, which you're then going to take and incorporate, 
the expenditure on buying the steelwork is alteration of land, is it? It's expenditure um, it's capital expenditure um, in the, the language of C. Yes, we would say um, if I give it right uh, is part of, of the, the, the process by which we altered the land for the purpose only of installing plant and machinery. And, and well, if, that, if that's not right, then you do what the first deal did, which is to say, well, you, you treat the concrete and the steel as being the thing, which the first day called an aqueduct, so I don't get relief for, but the cutter and the cover is the alteration of the land, for which I do get relief. And our case was logically consistent. We should have got it all, but we didn't. Right. Now, maybe the best one to test, because it's in its acutest form, is not the cut and cover, um, and it's not the head race, because I say we don't get there. Let's think of the tail race. The bottom section of the tail race was created by drilling and blasting up from Loch Ness. And once they'd gone, I think, 300 metres or so, um, they bored the rest uphill because of what became the caverns. And what you ended up with was a cylindrical tube that had shotcrete. I don't know if it's the full length, but shotcrete at least on, on parts of it. And we say the end result there is an item of common law plant, and that's not in dispute. So the expenditure we incurred there was in altering the land, and it was only to install, only to quote install, so to be tested, um, an item that is plant. And so the only reason against me, which the first year um, thought was right, uh, sorry, the upper tribunal thought was right, is that because you created it in situ, that's not within the meaning of installing. And our case is that read in context, it has to at least encompass installing where you create in situ. So the statutory question is, is installing in this context broad enough to cover creation in situ? Yeah. The upper tribunal said no. Right, but just to go back to a point that my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell asked, the, 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 if you had a breakdown of the cost of producing that, there would be a myriad different costs, the hourly rate of the people doing the... Um, that the, the concrete, the shop, the machinery that sprays the concrete onto the sides of the walls, the gantries that they go up and down. But are you saying that that's that's not how the capital allowance system works? You don't sort of break down the cost stack like that. You just look at what is well. What what do you do? You. you the, 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 the commissioners say, if I read it properly, all of that expenditure is on an asset that is going to be a capital asset. So it's not revenue deductible expenditure. Right. So it's all capital expenditure for which you get no write off in year one. And either you get capital allowances here over a very long period, um, or you get nothing. I hinted at this point, but the, the Commissioner's proposition here is we spent £200 million pounds over, um, for which we get no tax relief at all. Now that might be the right answer. I quite accept that. But it would be a surprising answer. So you don't break it down into labour and um, materials and all that? No, that would all be capitalised, and, and I think an accountant would say you just capitalise all that cost as being part of, all the, cost part of, of the, the cost, isn't it, of the, of the relevant 
you're, right. you're paying people weekly wages mm. and capitalizing the cost, and either you get your tax relief over 50 years or you don't get it at all. I suppose it's most easily visualized, isn't it? If you, uh, if you, as may well have been the case here, um, the taxpayer um, engaged a contractor to produce the plant. So there's a single price for the plant paid by the employer to the contractor. Uh, here, that, that is true. That is true here. Yes. But I mean, uh, it might be done internally, but uh, which might be more difficult. But anyway, yes. I, I, well, That's I, how I'm sort of seeing yeah, it. I, I hesitate to be definitive, but my understanding here yes. is that we just paid a we paid a hundred for the yes. production of the item. Yes. Uh, we didn't incur lots of costs ourselves. No. Yes, but the, the answer as to the allowability of it can't depend on that, right? right. Yeah. No. But no. But it, it illustrates. I mean, you might yes. get into more difficult points if you've got a labour force anyway, and you happen to use it on creating a capital item. Whereas you, you know, uh, but we need to typically then divide time up. And you say, would divide time up then. You'd say yes. these costs were attributable to that capital asset. I see. I see. Even if it was your own employed for yes. Uh, that I think is my understanding. Well, that's fine. Anyway, but, uh, yes. I, I hesitate to be definitive, yeah. but no, that's how it should work. Yeah. But, but ultimately, the debate in this court is, is, is this word broad yes. enough to cover yeah. creation in situ in the sense that I'm either right or wrong, but if I'm right, then I say the rest of it flows, and if I'm wrong, then c doesn't cover it. But what, what nobody seems to be able to say is, well, the policy behind this item is X, and therefore it should have a wider or a narrower meaning. Nobody is attempting to influence our decision by whether it ought or ought not to be allowable, assessed against some underlying scheme or policy. My lady, that, that, is, that is correct. We are agreed there is a broad policy discernible yeah. from what the minister has. So. But there's no policy arguments that help us on, from a thematic list B point. Not on, C, not on C22. No. What one can do the exercise with most of the items in list C, and you can find a decision of the court that reflects them. But you can't do that for all of them. And C22 is one that has no obvious case law exception. Now, I mean, the, the, um, in terms of broad policy, I found quite helpful the reference in paragraph 71 of the Upper Tribunal decision to um, what Lord Justice Fox said in Wimpy International, um, where he refers to the legislation was to seeking to reinforce the well-established distinction in general terms between the premises on which a business is carried on and the plant with which the business is carried on, the premises not being plant. So, I found that quite a helpful sort of steer as to, on a very general level, the, the, the sort of policy consideration. Well, well that, that, that is right, and that is the product of a hundred and odd years yes. of capital allowance cases. Yes. You draw that broad distinction yes. between the setting in which you carry on your business and the assets you use in your e business. E exactly. And one can see that in item 22 on this C, you're, you're getting very sort of close, this is where these are meeting very closely and, um, and, and, and purpose is being used as the uh, defining distinction. So in effect, Parliament is saying, without begging a question what does install mean, if you've incurred this expenditure only for a purpose yeah. of Doing something to that which is plant, you qualify. Yes. And the debate is, well, what is what is the what something is you have to exactly? Mm. <laughs> I, becomes, yeah. I was going to show you quickly two authorities. Um, the first is behind tab seventeen in the first volume of authorities. The decision of this court in the case of pressed cold. There's a case about a form of payroll tax called selective, selective employment tax. Um, and you 
paid tax or you didn't, depending on whether you were involved in manufacturing or construction. There were some very fine distinctions. But relevantly, the court had to address what they thought was, was meant by um, installation or installing. Uh, and the detail doesn't matter, but Lord Diplock's judgment begins at bundle page 168. But the relevant passage, short passage at 171, <coughs> there was a statutory, special statutory treatment um, if you were installing heating or ventilating apparatus. And what they were doing was making things on site. Right. That was a form of manufacturing. So the debate was is it also installing? Um, and what Lord Diplock says is that the relevant activity of the employees, which was making on site, it's apt. It's an, as apt a description to describe it as installing as manufacturing. But he saw no sharp distinction between the two. But he goes on to say it's the wrong sort of installing. But the better and better known passage comes in the judgment of Lord Justice Wynne, which begins at 172 but in particular the highlighted passage of 173. He cites here from a decision of the Court of Appeal of Manitoba, City of Winnipeg and Bryan Investments. Uh, perhaps can I just invite you quickly to read between letters C and I. <coughs> to the Canadian case was picked up again by this court in a case behind tab 19 which is the Engineering Industry Training Board and this was the late 1960s where there were training board levies and there was a separate levy for the engineering industry and one for the construction industry so you had to decide what your obligations were as, a, as an employer um, in a given industry. And what was going on here was that people were uh, constructing power stations, and part of that exercise involved constructing things on site. So they had to decide whether that was a construction activity or an engineering activity. Uh, and one of the questions was, were they installing items? by Lord Denning, Lord Wilberforce and Lord Justice Fillimore um, and you get the context from Lord Denning bundle page 195 <coughs> letter H uh, his lordship observes that this activity has to be under one board or another, it couldn't be in both so that was the exercise they were engaged on And then over a couple of pages, on page 197, Lord Wilberforce uh, says 
sets out to try and analyse at letter D words, article, manufacture, install, erect, structure, plant, none of which are very precise. And then over the page on page 198, uh, between letters B and C, the highlighted passage, he again picks up this notion of installation being a metaphorical word, not a word of great precision, and he again cites um, the city of Winnipeg. <coughs> now, in that case, it is true to say that they concluded that you installed something for the purposes of the training levy if you brought an item that already existed onto site and put it together. But in our capital allowances context, the other element to remind the court of is that we know from cases like the Barclay Curl <coughs> Digging holes and lining those holes with concrete is properly to be treated as the construction of the asset, even where it's constructed in situ rather than constructed off site and brought on site. Now, we haven't actually looked at Barclay because I've heard a lot about it. Um, whether the court needs to, but it, it's a case about the dry dock that was built on the bank of the Clyde. And what they first did was dug a, a, a large, enormous hole on the river bank, then lined it with concrete, and then put the kit in to hold the ships, and then they built a gate that fell out into the Clyde when they wanted to let the ships in or out. And the commissioners allowed allowances on everything, all the holding of ship kit and all the electrical and the pulleys and everything, that was all allowed. What wasn't allowed was the cost of digging the hole and the cost of pouring the concrete. And the House of Lords decided three to two that that was allowable, notwithstanding the effect that you constructed it in situ. Now, As, but it, it wasn't to do with installing, it was to do with constructing. The point I, I made in the upper tribunal, the upper tribunal thought it was a fair point, not a great point. If we go and look at the judgment of Lord Reed, he describes what they're doing in the language of installing. But that doesn't mean he thought, Lord Reed thought that installing in this context had that meaning because his lordship wasn't concerned with C23. So is the word installing or install or installation used elsewhere in this little group of sections? No. Because... I mean, if one looks at, I mean, we know from paragraph 22 that we've got a broad word, provision. And provision is defined so as to include, no doubt, for the avoidance of doubt, construction. But the draftsman eschews the word construction in item 22 and uses the word installation, which, as we can see from, for example, from what Lord Wilberforce has said, has a narrower meaning than construction, or a different meaning than construction, at any rate. Not necessarily narrow, but... but Certainly different. Different. Yeah, so that, that I mean, one, one can't ignore, can one, section 22.2 in discussing whether installing in item 22 includes construction. I quite accept that. Yes. I can't ignore it. But so, equally, equally, it's not determinative either. No, but if he was... If he's using installing in what m one might think of as the, the, the sort of ordinary meaning, which I think is exactly what Lord Wilberforce said, um, uh, you, you, might, you might expect him to say installing or constructing in item 22, given that he's already used the concept of construction in section 22 too. Um, unless I am right that the purpose of Parliament was not to limit the, the saving effect of C22 to well, the construction off-site. We, we have the construction, construction off-site off of an item and the bringing it to 
put in place on site. Well, that's installations. Yeah, so I'm, it, it, but I mean, sorry, we have to determine, we have really to determine the intention of Parliament from the words that Parliament has chosen to use, and so that's why I'm drawing your attention to... Well, look, I, I mean, maybe you've... I mean, we've... I mean, these are points you're well clear on, but I just want... aware of, but I, I just wanted to specifically point out the, the use of construction in Section 22 mm -hmm. and hear I, what I you said about that. quite accept that Parliament has chosen a different term um, that is not necessarily coterminous with construction. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily lead to the conclusion that it has a narrower meaning that doesn't encompass construction. It might be put the other way around, or that it, it doesn't have a meaning which is broadened to include construction. I mean, I think, I think taking Lord Wilberforce's analysis, uh, you would actually have, in, have, have to give a broader than usual meaning to the word install in order to include construction. Uh, my Lord, yes, I, that, that's l logically true, I accept that. But, but equally, in a world where Parliament has determined by C22 to save some expenditure from the effect of Section 21 in circumstances where allowances are available for items created in situ. Yes. Yeah. That then points, doesn't get me home, I quite accept, but it points towards the conclusion I invite the board to arrive at, which is that it here has a broad enough meaning. Could go either way. To encompass. Yeah. But, and just to, to go back to this. What is it, what is being installed? As I understand it, one doesn't sort of look at well, they brought the steel mesh from somewhere else and put that here, or they brought they, those sections of hexagonal cover were prefabricated and brought here. It's not those bits of it that are being installed or not installed. It has to be the whole the, the plant the whole plant. And it, it, that's acutely true here because that cut, the cut and cover section was the concrete was poured in situ. It wasn't as if we brought slabs and bolted them. It was. But even if you did, you, you're not talking about installing the concrete bits of it. You're in, talking about installing what is ultimately the plant, which is the contour. Yes. Yeah. Well, our case, just to draw the threads together, is that um, Parliament has recognised when using the term installing that it should provide um, relief in circumstances where either you bring an item and install it, that which being the item being prefabricated, or if you create it in situ, there being no difference in principle as to whether you should get allowances in one case and not in the other. And then the question is for the tribunal to discern, as a matter of fact and degree, whether that which is, uh, well, that which allowances are claimed for um, amounts to installing. And if it concludes that that is the case, then that's a matter of fact to the tribunal that the upper tribunal shouldn't have interfered. <coughs> So what, just for your note, what the first tier did was stand back and formed a view. It's paragraph 79, um, and there's no um, principled reason why that, that is wrong in law. Now, if I'm wrong about that, that takes me to my last, um, my capital answers question, which is C25. Yeah, quite fine. And here again, it may help just to see it in, in context. It's tab three, page 37. Uh, there was a debate below about a missing comma when the legislation was, was transcribed, but one could put a line in the phrase after pipeline. Oh, yeah. So here, I have to establish that it's expenditure incurred on the provision of pipelines. Now, the 
first tier said no to this, that's their paragraph 72, 73. The upper tribunal said no to this, that's their paragraphs 137 to 140. In each case, on the basis that a pipeline necessarily required jointed sections of pipes. So some of the sections that we're not arguing about now were single plastic lengths of pipe that were joined. Some of them are double plastic lengths of pipe that were joined. Some of them are concrete lengths of pipe that were joined. All of that is accepted to qualify. What we're concerned with now is where those sections were then joined either to the cut and cover section where you saw what was created and then covered over, or the next section down is the drilled and blasted section, which is then lined with shock cream. So against that background, we say a, a section of jointed pipes is a pipeline, but a pipeline is not limited to a section of jointed pipes. It doesn't matter how you install it or create it. It can be plastic or concrete in short sections or long sections. You can lay it on the seabed from a ship. There are ships that lay pipelines where they just unwind it and they are jointed at some point because you can't have a hundred kilometers worth of, of unjointed. Right. I mean, I don't think that, does pipeline necessarily involve a joint? I mean, supposing it was technically possible to make um, a 1,000 metre stretch of pipe, would it, would, it, would it cease to be a pipeline or not become a pipeline because it isn't jointed? At the well, on the, the approach below, yes, but I, I would say no. As a practical matter, it doesn't really arrive. I mean, this isn't the point, is it? it the real point is, is a pipe, does a pipeline include um, something which is just the construction rather than a separate piece of kit? Isn't that really the point? That wasn't the basis of the decision against me below. I see. But I would take your logical observation. If I have a, I have a hose pipe in my garden. Yes. It's really a pipe. It's a pipe. Depending on the length of your garden. I mean, no one uses joint. a pipeline for watering their roses, but. Supposing you were carrying oil from um, the terminal to uh, storage tanks over over two kilometres, and you, you have to have a Wizzo process, which meant that the plastic pipe was a continuous run with no joint, I, I wouldn't have thought anyone would say that wasn't a pipeline. I, we would endorse that. Yes. So joints is not the essential point. Well, if, if, that's a, if that were the view of the court, we would say yes to that. Right. But then if the, the case against us is, well, there is a, a difference of principle between something that is prefabricated and put into the ground as opposed to something that is created in situ by cutting the wood, drill and blast, however, however done, once you have as an end result a cylindrical tube yes is it a pipeline that here carries liquid or it could carry gas doesn't matter which yeah. irrespective of its form of manufacture it is Does it have to be cylindrical in its cross section? It doesn't have to be cylindrical, no. I, I, I recognise as soon as I said it, that's not a necessary <coughs> part of it, but think of cylindrical. But I don't think it has to be underground either. It doesn't have to be underground. Um, we had a little bit of evidence before this. Um, other schemes, for example, have a head race and a tail race that's laid on the surface. Here it's underground for technical and environmental reasons. But if we'd laid it on the surface, there'd be no real debate about this. 
conversely, if we put a plastic liner all the way through the sections that we cut and covered and drilled and blasted and shot creased, if we put a plastic liner, so we'd spent more money, there would be no debate about this. Well, I mean, the, yeah, all right. So we, we would be in a bizarre world that by not having spent another hundred million. I mean, your difficulty is, I think, if I may cut to the chase, that uh, what you're describing is not what most people would call a pipeline. So uh, why should it bear a, a non-ordinary meaning here? Or am I wrong to say that it's that's the ordinary meaning? Well, uh, we wouldn't accept that that is the ordinary meaning or the only ordinary meaning. All right. So what support do you have for that? Well, we, we have got... Um, <coughs> A dictionary definition, which is uh, page six said against me that the first part before the semicolon is unhelpful. <laughs> Continuous line of joined pipes, especially one used for conveying oil or gas, etc. long distances. After the semicolon, a usually flexible tube for carrying fluid and machinery. So how does that help? Well, if we're looking at, if we ignore usually flexibles, it doesn't have to be flexible, so a tube for carrying fluid. In, in machinery, etc. He says. I'm not sure what the etc. means, but uh, it seems quite a narrow meaning there, doesn't it? Well, that does recommend. Does that really cover what you're talking about here? In any case, that is a prefab. Surely the tube there is a prefabricated piece uh, of equipment. It's likely to be, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But the the point I was seeking to make is that there's no there is no single ordinary meaning. Well, I think. Forgive me, but I, I would have thought that. Page six seven four accords with what I would think of as the ordinary meaning. Well, but if, if that were right, then then the fact that I don't have joint joined pipes would be right. well. Would that's be because of there isn't such a thing as uh, as uh, the sort of con, you know huge lengths of continuous pipe. But um, I think that's a uh, yeah. But, but, uh, but, but, it's, but, it's hardly a winning point for you. There. Yeah. <laughs> well, except I think you would say when it says oil, gas, etc. Etc. includes water because you can oh, sure. easily have a water pipeline. So oh, yes, yes, yes. Su subject, not... subject to joins, you're, you're, yes. you're, no. <coughs> you say you're in, within the first part of it, don't you? Uh, if, if, if we're entitled to say joins are not necessary, Sorry, then I've misread it, forgive me. Then I would say yes. If it says a continuous line, forget joins, a pipe pipes. or join pipes, but we've still got a pipe, right. haven't we, on any footing? We, we, we would yes, say here that the end a result pipe of line is a line of pipes. pipes. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but, but we would say, my lord, right. gracious, but what we have here is a, is a pipe. Is a series of pipes that are joined. Right. Some of them are right. plastic. Some of them are concrete. Some we cut and covered. Some we bored. But the whole process of that whole six and seven kilometres is to deliver water from A to B. Yes. Right. And maybe that's. That, that is the point, but standing back, we say um, it is it is a pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're, I see. You're really looking at the overall. But supposing there were no, there was nothing at all. The whole thing was just bored through the rock. You put a machine in, a boring machine, created a cylindrical hole through the rock where necessary. You had sort of put a bit of shock treat or whatever it is, and then you passed water through it. That, that you'd say, well, look at the function. It fulfills the function of carrying, in this case, water from A to B. It's there for a pipeline. Yes. That's really the point. That is it, it doesn't really matter that some parts of it did have plastic tubing and some didn't. 
Does it? Or does well, it? For my part, it doesn't. No. no, no. But but it, if it says it's again, a pipeline. If it if it fulfills the the function, the same function as a what you might commonly think of as a pipeline. Yes. Yes. It's it's a con okay. It's a cylindrical tube that allows... Or it might be square. Or it might be square. It's a tube <laughs> of some shape exactly. that permits the conveyance here of water from A to B. Yes, okay. I've got it. I understand. Thank you. And that, and that's your, that comes within the definition of pipe, page 638. Uh, it does, my lord, yes. Hollow cylinder or tube of metal, plastic, wood or other material used to convey water, gas, etc. Uh, yes, and if, if if that's the meaning of pipe, then I still have a line that quotes pipes. So what page was that? 638. Six, six, <coughs> Thank you very much. You, you would say that, that my example of the the hole bored through the rock uh, is a tube. It is. And so if, if need be, we would rely on C25, and standing back, we would say there's nothing inherently objectionable in that as a result. Well, the definition of tube here. Uh, <laughs> <don't think laughs> the process of infinite <laughs> regression. <laughs> we can look it up. Yeah. But, but nothing inherently objectionable in that result, standing back, because we have built a series of tubes. Why isn't it an underground duct? Uh, the legislative history of that suggests that it was introduced only to deal with um, underground ducting that would carry um, Utility ele convicts. electricity cables. All right, fair enough. I, I went to that. It was yeah. prompted, I think, by the London Electricity Board. All right. Fine. Yes, thank you. Um, so that's what I'd say on my question five. Yes. Um, I'm conscious that we haven't dealt with my lady's examples, but if I just deal with a procedural question, yes, do. and then we might see where we, we are. Might break. Exactly. Yes. Well, short point um, on mm. the cut and cover concrete conduit, the commissioners the first year gave us part of the expenditure, but not all of it. And the upper tribunal said that rested on an error of law, and they gave us all of it. But it's the upper tribunal, paragraphs 151 to 150. Just give me it. So it's the upper tribunal, 151. To 154, dealing with the first tier at 81 to 84. And that gave us, financially, a little more than we got out of the first tier decision. Because the court would agree, we'd won some things in the first tier and we'd lost others. But this result gave us a little more. It's not to the tune of millions, it's, I don't know, tens of thousands. Now, we didn't appeal the first tier. We were not entirely happy, but we were broadly happy, so we didn't appeal. The commissioners did appeal, but it wasn't, wasn't clear to us whether they would appeal until they did. Mm -hmm. As my learned friend explained yesterday, we wouldn't know that necessarily until have appealed. Um, we put a respondent's notice in that made clear that we would repeat the arguments we had lost on below, <coughs> and we drew particular intention to, uh, to repeat our argument about aqueducts. So just for your note, our respondent's or our response notice is in the supplementary bundle at tab 3. And we raised squarely the question of what is meant by aqueduct and what does that do then to the categorization of the assets for the various assets. Now, it is then right that my friend put a response in to our respondent's notice to say, 
as regards that little element, you should have appealed. <clears throat> and we hadn't appealed. We didn't appeal out of time. So we hadn't put in a contingent appeal. No. We didn't believe we had to, nor did we put in an appeal out of time. Had we done so, we would have been met by two principal objections. One, you are out of time. And two, allowing you to pursue this appeal out of time may cause prejudice to your opponent. And the authorities are such that if there is to be um, uh, the pursuit of an appeal outside of time, the courts are now broadly put taking a much more, um, I don't say aggressive, but a, um, robust. a more robust approach <laughs> to allowing appeals out of time. So you need a particularly good reason and you need to establish that you're not going to cause prejudice either to the parties or to the running of the tribunal system. So if we'd appealed out of time, we may or may not have got permission. But we didn't. But what we had done was put Maloney Friend squarely on notice of the point we were going to pursue, so that he was in no doubt about it, in circumstances where the tribunal rules provide for us to put a response in, raising grounds on which we lost below, and allowing us to identify <coughs> why we say we were right below. So that was the position when we got to the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal has to decide the aqueduct question, because it had amplification, it had ramifications elsewhere, and having decided it, it then corrected what it saw as that minor error by the first tier in our favour. But in tax but tribunal, when you were, I, I haven't, I haven't just got quite straight. I should have, but I haven't in my mind. That when you were argue, when HMRC appealed on the issue of aqueduct, yeah, the, the, they had won on aqueduct. Forgive me. Uh, so who raised the issue of aqueduct yeah, before the for the upper tribunal? Um, I thought. I, 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 I thought the revenue did. Uh, well, Lord, I did have an appeal on aqueduct because of the head race, which was held not to be an aqueduct. That's right. Yes. So that's how that's how it came. That's how the issue of aqueduct came before the upper tribunal. Well, Yes, but right? not only that way, because we raised aqueduct in but, our response. Oh, I see. So you might not have you might have raised that whether or not the revenue had raised aqueduct. Your junior's nodding. Um, <laughs> he's nodding, and the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd say that. Uh, <laughs> because what we wanted to, given that we would have rested where we sat at the end of the first tier, but given that the commissioners had gone on, we wanted to no, put. Sorry. The, all the issues back on the table again. So we did but it by way of response. This, this was only a point that, was it only in relation to the cuts and covered conduits that this splitting of expenditure between excavation and um, non-excavation, excavation being allowable and non-excavation not being allowable, was it only in relation to cut and cover? Oh, only this. Right, okay. So this was... That cut and cover was held not to be an aqueduct by the first. Uh, held to be an aqueduct. Oh, yes, that's tier. the point. Yes, yes, yes. So it was I'm... held to be an aqueduct and therefore excluded by list B, but they said some of it could be saved by C22. By C22. Right. Then the. Um, Upper tribunal said it's not an aqueduct. We don't have to worry then about um, C22. And, and we don't have to split. Right. So if it's not an aqueduct, it's not a tunnel, it's not anything in this B, we don't go to 22B because it's a structure. We get it all. And we get it all. Right. So the, the numbers are not right, but. Before we were getting, let me guess, 80 out of 100. And what the upper tribunal did said, well, once you correct what 
we see as the error of rule, you no longer split that, you get a hundred. But if, um, just, so on the cut and cover, is this, is this right, the revenue appealed on the C22 issue? I mean, they obviously wouldn't appeal on the aqueduct. Uh, no, they, they'd won the C... They, yes, they did appeal on the C22. They lost on the C22. They, did, yes, so they, they won on aqueduct, yes. but lost on C22. Yes. So they just appealed C22, basically, I, let's say, saying you're not allowed anything. You you, you, you got you asked for 100, you got 60, but you should have got nothing. As regards this asset, that's correct. This asset. Um, so... If this was the only asset where the question of aqueduct was relevant, the issue of aqueduct would never have been before the, um, the tribunal, would it, without you appealing? Because you, you couldn't really support the C22 argument on the basis, well, it's an aqueduct, or, or sorry, that it's not an aqueduct, because then C22 is irrelevant. Uh, that's, that's correct. So it was the happenstance, if you like, of the revenue appealing on a separate item on the issue of aqueduct that gives rise to, to this matter. That is right, because they wanted to challenge aqueduct elsewhere. Yes, exactly. I've got, just got it straight in my mind now. I mean, that doesn't answer the point you say, do you? Well, you just leave on one side the fact that the revenue appealed that. You'd say you would still have been would you entitled to challenge um, the um, decision of the FTT that it was an aqueduct, a case of cut and cover with, without any need for leave. Once there is an appeal and provided... Yes, well, I suppose they had appealed on something completely different. Or just, as, forgive me, no, they appealed on just C to the C22 point, let's just say, otherwise it wouldn't be before the court at all. So, well, let's say the only appeal that came before the upper tribunal was on C22 in respect of cut and cover, would you have been able to raise the aqueduct issue? Yes, because we would have said you you were right about C22, but legally you don't get to C22 because we have another reason. We think you made another error logically yeah. earlier. So you can, you, you have complete free, uh, yes, I see. Would you have been able to, supposing Revenue had appealed on a different item, not on cut and cover. Could you have raised the aqueduct point on cut and cover? And this is all a question of construction of the rules and the act, of course. I mean, I think your case procedure is, is procedurally yes. A respondent can raise in a respondent's notice any cross appeal, but it's subject to the case management powers of the upper tribunal as to whether they'll permit that to be advanced by way of a respondent's notice. So that there isn't a permission filter, it, but it, there is a case management filter. So that's, that's what I understood to be your In your effect, case. my lord, yes, with right. this refinement, that that is most easily seen where the respondent only wishes to repeat arguments he has already made below. So this all turns on... Um, Yes. This all turns. Well, I was going to say this turns on. Does it just turn on Rule Twenty Four of the uh, the Upper Tribunal Rules? Yeah, it does. So you can you have a response to the notice of appeal. What page is that? I think it's in tab thirteen at page, page one three seven. And um, you're, you must state, it says sub rule three, I think paragraph three, isn't it? 24. You must state uh, A, B, C, D, whether the respondent opposes the appeal. Oh, I see. So, hold on, let me understand this. So, under 1A, a respondent may provide a response. Uh, and then, so, but if you provide a response, it must state D, whether you oppose the appeal, and E, the grounds on which the respondent relies, in 
including in the case of an appeal against the decision of another tribunal, in this case the FTT, any grounds on which the respondent was unsuccessful in the proceedings which are the subject of the appeal, intends to rely upon the appeal. That's what we believe you did. Yes. So... Because we're not tsunami slicing up the decision. No. So, because you say, well... The right to appeal, as we looked at this, it's expressed as being against the decision. Against the decision on the basis of an error of law. Because E seems to, certainly as amended, seems to... And it uses the word decision, and it uses the word grounds. One further feature of tax appeals that's not relevant to the other tribunals, which is that the first tier, and the upper tier, and indeed this court, have power under the Tax Mismanagement Act to make an adjustment up or down. And that is designed to arrive at a situation where the right amount of tax is collected, neither too much nor too little. And the lady might remember we had a debate in a case called Investec about the venerable principle, which underlies a lot of the procedural material here, which is that principle being that it's designed to arrive at the right amount of tax. Is that the one about the partnership? It's about the closure notices where there was an adjustment made in the closure notice that was in a different numerical amount to the argument that the commissioners wanted to run in the litigation. And so we had a debate about closure notices. But this power, it's in the bundle, it's tab 8, I think. This power is peculiar to tax appeals. But this is general, isn't it? This isn't just tax appeals. No, this is general. There are equivalent, there are like rules. Oh, this is just tax? No, these are general. These are general, yes. So this point could arise in other chambers of the upper tribunal? It could. I see. What is your answer in relation to the jurisdiction point, which arises out of section 11, essentially, which we looked at, which is behind tab 10, which is that subparagraph 2 says any party has a right of appeal. Subsection 3 says it can only be exercised with permission. And then we go back to 1 to see what it is that can only be done with permission. And it's an appeal against a decision on a point of law. And that is what you're doing, isn't it, in relation to the aspect of the cut and cover expenses on which you failed as part of the decision of the first tier tribunal? We say no, my lord, because the commissioners made an appeal. And once they had made an appeal alleging an error of law, the rules then provide for us to have the right to put a response in. And if we do put a response in, we are permitted to rely on any grounds. Which are unsuccessful. And any grounds on which on which we were unsuccessful in the proceedings which are the subject of the appeal. So there's no filter. Leave aside the facts of this case, leave aside the tax context. There's no filter. Once one side has appealed, 
the other side is has an absolute entitlement to rerun all the arguments on which it's failed at first instance without any permission filter. Is that the effect of this? Put most starkly, yes. That's quite a, an unwelcome result, I would have thought. Well, but, but Lord, it, it, that reflects the language of, of uh, 24.3e. Once there is an appeal, so we are entitled to provide a response to the appeal, and if we do, we must set out uh, any grounds on which we were unsuccessful in the proceedings, which are the subject of the appeal, but intends to rely in, in the appeal. There is a case management control over that. That's what I thought you were going to say. But it's not a jurisdictional problem. But how, how does the case management side of this work? Because if, um, if we were to, to attempt to rely both on grounds that we ran below and on some completely new point that we thought of, in those circumstances, the oh. The upper tribunal could well, step no, in. no, I thought you were going to say that, that, that uh, the respondent's notice must set out any grounds on which you intend to rely, uh, you wish to rely, but whether on which you were unsuccessful below, but whether you are allowed to advance those grounds well, that, that, will be the subject matter of Rule 5 case management powers, which are general powers which allow the upper tribunal to give directions in relation to the conduct or disposal of the proceedings at any time. Well, um, back at page 131. That, that as well. And then, so, so that that is the filter, you, you, you're entitled to seek, seek to raise them by your respondent's notice, but whether in fact you do so is subject to the case management filter in Rule 5, and that would then align it with the position in CPR 5213, is it, where in a respondent's notice you can include a, a permission to cross appeal, the Lord, but you don't have an absolute right to do so. The Lord, yes, um, with this addition that in exercise of the powers under Rule 5, the tribunal is required to have regard to the overriding objective in Rule 2, which is back at page 100. 30, and that includes dealing with the case in a proportionate way, but also 2 to b avoiding unnecessary formality and seeking flexibility in the proceedings. So the, the debate ought not to be about jurisdiction, because we submit it isn't. It's about um, fairness to the parties and to the tribunal. To ensure that litigation runs smoothly. Mm. But, but what if what if you had thought up some new brilliant idea on the aqueduct point, which was not a point which you'd raised below and therefore you hadn't been success, unsuccessful on it, but it was only seeking to uphold the um, FTT's wide. Uh, meaning of aqueduct. How does that get before the tribunal or are you? Well, that w would be capable of being included, would be included in a response, um, but then it will be subject to the case management control of the upper tribunal as to whether I would be allowed to run that new argument, albeit a new argument to the same numerical result. So you're not saying that you are limited by Rule 24 only to thinking up brilliant, only to the unsuccessful points in answer to the in direct answer to the appeal. Uh, no, it's it's including grounds on which I was unsuccessful below. But I'm I mean, isn't looking at E again, 24? One re one reading of. 24, 3E. Is it is it that you're required to specify the grounds on which you rely in opposing the appeal? 
Okay, read it with D. Our reading, my lord, is that D requires you to take a stance as to whether you're just going to allow the appeal. Indeed, but if you're going to oppose the appeal, if, if you're going to if you're going to join the appeal game, yes. then you have to do things in E. Exactly, you have to specify the grounds on which you will oppose the appeal. Yes, but isn't that your difficulty? Because this isn't what you're doing here is not opposing the appeal. You're seeking to appeal another aspect. We're, we are here attempting to repeat a point we made below. I know, appreciate that, but that's that. the including words are governed by what precedes it, namely the grounds on which the respondent relies. But, but, but and that surely that is, or what I'm suggesting to you is poss possible reading, is that that is linked with, with D, which is opposing the appeal. But, but Lord, if that were right, I wouldn't be allowed to repeat a point I'd been successful on. Why not? Because that wouldn't be opposing the appeal. Yeah, it would. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Well, you're you opposing might, you the appeal a... by relying on the same grounds as you relied on successfully below. Because the, po the point on which you had been successful below would ex hypothesize. Yeah. yeah. But what, what you're allowed to do is to add on another ground which didn't find favour with the first tier tribunal. And that you were required to make that clear. So. Well, that, they are. Yeah, if that's the test, that's what we in effect did here, because we said the first tier had got aqueduct wrong. It, it does come back, doesn't it, to the question of whether you can appeal at, yeah. on grounds or you've got to appeal in relation to a decision. Um, well, the, the court, we, we have a principled answer that this is not a question of jurisdiction. There's no jurisdictional bar to what we've done. Well, it's that all depends on, on the act when read with mm -hmm. this rule. But I, we have your submission that but, it, it does, there's no jurisdictional bar. And, and, and then it's a matter of prejudice. Then, no prejudice or then it's a matter of good case management. Although I, I, I find it slightly odd if you have a right as a respondent to appeal a part of the decision. I mean, the, the tribunal can't simply disregard that on case management grounds. I mean, we'd have to form a view that it shouldn't waste its time on it because it's hopeless or something. That's, that's the argument. That would be the argument. I could do it of its own motion or at the invitation of the other party. So effectively providing a permission filter. Yes. Yes, I see. Which would be different, would it, from the criteria which the first tier tribunal would consider if you had had to go back to them and ask for permission? Put another way, if, as you say, you might have done, you wouldn't have been able to persuade a first tier tribunal to give you permission out of time. Why, why should the upper tribunal allow you to? Because, because the first tier tribunal is, is, is exercising a, a case management discretion. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no inherent objection in the upper tribunal doing the same thing, albeit that it, that decision comes to it by a different route. Well, I, I quite understand they might it being discretionary, they might two different bodies might come to different conclusions, but they ought to apply the same principles. Well, but but, but, look, but they, they would be doing because had we gone back and asked the first tier late, we would have had to have established is there a good reason for being late yes. and will this cause prejudice? Yes. Um, if the upper tribunal, if we'd not done that and the upper tribunal had exercised the case management function, it, the question of us being late may not have arisen, but if it did, it would have less force. But the upper tribunal would still be exercising a case management function to decide whether the other side was prejudiced by us being permitted to pursue the well I, follow, well, I follow that, but all I'm, all I'm exploring is uh, whether uh, someone in, in your position, or more generally, is in, a, is in a worse position by having to go through the exercise which it suggested you should have done, which is apply for permission out of time from the first tier tribunal. And the, the factors which inform the exercise of the discretion at that stage ought not to be any different I, I, from I, the I, factors which inform what you say is a permissible course of the upper tribunal exercising its own case management. Uh, we say exactly that the factors would have been the same. Yes. So that the, the only real issue is, should we have put in a 
contingent appeal that might have been a waste of time? Or, not having done that, should we then have applied out of time where that, of course, inevitably is going to lead to lots of satellite litigation before the first year as to whether per permission should be granted in circumstances where I didn't put in a contingent appeal? Right. Right. Well, we'll, we'll break there. Um, so, um, uh, after, after, uh, we'll resume at 10 past 2, and you can, uh, I mean, if there's just anything you want to add to what you've just said about procedure, it probably yeah. won't be a full is it what you want to say. So, but that, oh, oh, over lunch, you could have a look at the, um, the uh, problems, should I put it the that way, the, the, the worked examples, right, that was what I was looking for. Um, and and uh, give us uh, any response you want to on that, um, and then Mr. Brennan will hear your reply. Thank you very much. Ten